How's everybody doing? All right. So, can I see the hands of those who, it's their first time here. It's your first time to visit River of Life. Can I see your hands? Wow, let's, let's give them a hand. Get, just keep your hands raised if it's your first time. Uh, if I can make sure, ushers, if you could remember them. Um, before you leave, after this service, if you could go visit on that side of the exit, um, and we'll be glad to put a gift in your hand. And um, if, if there's something that we can uh, pray with you uh, for, just let us know. We'll be glad to do that. Amen. Uh, so we're going to continue our message from last week, um, which we were looking into two chapters in the book of Luke, Luke 14 and uh, 15. Um, and, and let me start with um, giving you a recap of what we talked about last week so that we'll better understand what this mess, what the message for today will be. Now, in Luke 14, Luke 14, it starts with Jesus being invited to uh, the house of a ruler, uh, um, ruler of the Pharisees. And Jesus was invited, not because they were nice to Jesus. Jesus was not invited because Jesus was popular. Yeah, part of it is that. But they have a motive why they have invited Jesus. And that motive was to um, look and see what they can find in Jesus. Uh, they are looking to find a fault in Jesus so that they could, um, they could have a, a claim against him. So that was the reason why they invited him uh, to eat with them. Now, as Jesus went into this, um, the, the ruler's house, the ruler of the Pharisee's house, uh, he saw several people in there, and he noticed that what the person, the, the host of the party, uh, those he invited were those who he knew. They're their relatives. They're probably their fellow Pharisees. There's probably a lot of VIPs uh, because... How many of you know if I'm having a party and, and if I have an important person in my party, a lot of people would want to come to my party, right? And it's the same, th same way uh, back then. There's no difference. When we give out party, they, they do the same way uh, back then. And so he noticed, Jesus noticed that the people that were invited were people who the host knew. And... Um, they also, he also noticed that there were people who took the important places. Uh, back then, uh, they, they have this special place for VIPs in parties. And, you know, just like in a wedding, you know, Pastor Bob and, and his family are going to be they're in San Antonio right now for Nora and uh, Greg's wedding. How, do you, how, how many of you know that during a wedding, you have this presidential uh, table? where uh, that's where the, uh, the newlywed will be seated and the sponsors. And pretty much they're the, uh, in our eyes, they're the most important people of the party. And back then, it was the same way. Now, Jesus noticed that when he entered the house, he noticed those people who tried to get into those uh, important places without being invited. And then uh, he addressed the... Um, he addressed the visitors. He addressed the host of the party, telling the host of the party, you know, when you invite people, don't invite those who you think can invite you back. You know, don't invite just those who, uh, who could bless you back. Invite those who are lame. Invite those who don't have the ability to repay you. That's what Jesus was telling them. And so he finished eating in, in that place. And so we, we continue it with Luke 15. In Luke 15, it starts with, And all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. Now let me backtrack here. It says, When he left the house where the party was going on, he says here, A great multitude followed him. Now, he just came out from, from that party, from that banquet. And so we will, uh, in our mind, we could see that 
both those who were invited in the party actually went out to follow him. And also in those times when there's a party of important people, how many of you know that the whole neighborhood will know about it? However, those poor people won't be able to get inside. What they'll do is they'll be waiting outside. Now, especially at this point, they've heard a lot about Jesus. What have they heard about Jesus? They've heard Jesus healing. They've heard uh, Jesus uh, making the lame to walk, making the, the blind to see, uh, feeding uh, 5,000 people. So this news have gone around the community that people knew about Jesus. And so think about it. You have people who know that Jesus was, was invited into a party, into a certain house. But let's say I'm a poor person. I won't be able to get into that party. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll stay outside and wait until he comes out so that I can follow him wherever he goes. Now imagine there's hundreds of people who are doing this and waiting for him. So when he went out of the house, he came out of the house to go somewhere else. It says here a great multitude went with him. And we know that the multitude comprised of the people who were in the party and the people who were waiting outside of the house. And he said, he turned to them, if anyone, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, and he, uh, we've, we've read this last week, what, it's, what he's saying is, if you're following me for this reason, and what are those reasons? If you're following me just because I've done those miracles, if you're following me because I'm a good man, if you're following me because I'm a good teacher, this is the requirement if you want to follow me. And what he shared was that it's almost impossible. And he likened it to when, a salt, when salt loses its salt, saltiness, its flavor, it's impossible to put that flavor back into salt. It's, he's saying it's impossible. It's going to be impossible for you to follow me if you're following me with that motive. And then, is he, he, and then he says there, um, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. So we are going to start with the message today from this chapter, Luke 15. Now notice that it's the tax collectors, it is the tax collectors and the sinners who drew near to him. After he said that, whoever follows me, you have to hate your father. You have to do this. You have to leave everything uh, behind if you want to follow me. Guess who followed him? The tax collectors and the sinners. It is just a proof that those who are thinking that to, for, to, to follow Christ is to do something. To follow Christ is to follow certain lists of do's and don'ts. When the invitation comes, you're not going to be able to follow Christ because the cost, the stake is too high. But when it comes to sinners... And tax collectors, it's sinners and tax collectors just represents those who don't have anything to give back to Christ. Those who can't boast of anything of their own. Those who are bankrupt, socially bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt. Those who can't offer anything. Guess what? They are the ones who are able to go to Him. Because when we see Christ, when we follow Christ... As somebody who is going to save us, there is no requirement. The only requirement is, well, there's no requirement as to what we, need, what we need to do for him. No, the only thing we need to do is come to him, go to him, and he receives us. So it says here, and the Pharisees and scribes complained. What did they complain about? Remember, in the multitudes, there were the scribes, the Pharisees, the guests in the party, and you have the sinners and the, and the tax collectors. So when the tax collectors and sinners went to Jesus to hear him, the Pharisees, those who think that they deserve more, those who think, that oh, they deserve God because they know the word of God in the first place. They're the teachers of the law. They're the ones who complained. 
And what was their complaint? Uh, look here. It says, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Is that, does this sound a complaint? It, it's, this man receives sinners and eats with them. If, if I make it to a complaint in our own, in our modern language, it's like green straightforward. Why is this man, why are you receiving these sinners and you're eating with these sinners? Why are you doing this? And then you know what Jesus' response is? It's here. And this is what we're going to be listening to. We're going to be studying this. So he spoke this parable to them saying, now I want you to remember this. These parables are being related by Jesus in response to what? In response to the complaint of the scribes and the Pharisees. Okay? Which is the complaint, why is this man eating with the sinners or receiving the sinners and eating with them? So let's look at the parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise... There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So what is this parable? Parable? This is uh, well known as the parable. It is the, uh, the good shepherd. Or the parable of the lost sheep. I'm sorry. The parable of the lost sheep. Now let's look at what is the subject in this parable. Who's the subject in the parable? There's quietness in the room. Is it the sheep or the shepherd? Okay. What is the subject? What is the subject of the parable? What is a parable all about? Now, a lot of, a lot of times, even in your Bible, if you have your Bible, a certain versions would have a heading like the parable of the lost sheep. Uh, it's unfortunate that they focus on the lost sheep. But really, what was the question that the scribe asked? Why is this man eating and receiving the sinners? And then Jesus answers, I, let me tell you, let me relate to you a parable. So remember, all the subject, all the subject in these parables will be a certain man. Because the question is, why are you? Okay? So it's not the lost sheep. Why do we know that? Well, look at this. Look, look here. Who had a hundred sheep? A man. What a man is that of you? If he loses one. Or who loses one? It was the man. Okay? Now, who went to find that one sheep that was lost? It was the man who went looking out for it. And when he found it, uh, who placed the sheep, who, who was placed on the shoulder? Was the man placed on the shoulder or was the sheep placed on the shoulder? It was the sheep. It was the man who placed the sheep on the shoulder. And who went home rejoicing? It was the man. Who went home rejoicing and inviting his friends to uh, celebrate with him? The man. Now, who was joyful that the sheep was found? Was it the sheep? It was the man also, okay? Although we say that, oh, when we are like lost sheep, when we find Jesus, okay? Actually, we never find Jesus. Jesus was never lost. We are the one lost. And so just like this, it was the shepherd who looks for us and, lo and finds us. And when we are found, although there is this great joy that we experience when we receive Christ, but you know what? There is greater joy in heaven. Why? Because the Father in heaven is so uh, filled with joy. It says here, when one sinner repents. Now, notice this. He likened, in this parable, the re look at repentance. Uh, you probably would ask, uh, who was supposed to be repenting here? Was it the sheep or the shepherd? The man. 
the sheep, right? Now, you would ask the question, how did the sheep ever repent? Because it says here, uh, you know, I say to you that likewise, the same manner, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. He's liking the, the sheep that was lost as somebody who, who sinned and who needs to repent. But did, how did the sheep repent? Did the sheep, oh, God, sorry, I'm so sorry for all my sins. Uh, you, could you imagine the sheep doing that? <laughs> you do that, right? See, the only thing that the sheep had to do as a sign of repentance was to allow the shepherd to pick him up and put him, put the sheep on his shoulders. That's the only thing. See, the sheep did not say, okay, from now on, I'm going to follow you always. From now on, I'm going to feed on grass where you bring me. From now on, I'll do this, I'll do that. The sheep can never do that. You see, that is why here the subject is the man. It's the man who keeps, who takes care of that sheep. That even when the sheep goes away, goes astray, goes astray, it's that man who's going to be following, who's going to be looking. And when he's found, it's that man's responsibility to put him, put the sheep on his shoulder. Put him on his shoulder, not doing nothing, but just letting the man Bring him home. Okay? Now let's look at another parable. Or what woman? It says here, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp. Sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me. For I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who, rep, who repents. Oh, here again, another one. A, a, a joy in, in, in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And this one sinner is like, likened to the one coin. Could you imagine how can a coin repent? I don't have an answer to that either. But definitely it's not uh, the repentance that we normally know. The repentance of crying and and uh, being sad and being self-condemned, having self-pity. That's not the repentance that it's talking about here. Okay? Now, this woman had ten silver coins. And it is uh, a woman who actually is getting married. When, when they're getting married in that culture, they have part of their uh, dress, of their wedding gown. They have coins around the, the gown. And, and it says here, one coin is lost. And what, what did they use? What did she use to find that coin? Is lighting the lamp. Lighting the lamp to find that coin. And we'll, um, we'll conclude the, the, the message with this last parable. This is a parable that is very popular. You probably have known this parable uh, even before you were uh, a Christian. I've known this when I was going to school. Um, and it is the parable of the prodigal son. So let's look into it. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Now, I would like to give you a background of what it feels like when somebody, a son, asks you about their inheritance. Now, if, if you have a huge inheritance, okay, and you said, you know, when, when my living will, I would distribute this inheritance to my children. And one child will get this, another will get this, another will get this. Now, how many of you know their inheritance will, you'll get the inheritance once your, once the testator dies, right? Is that true for inheritance? It is when that testator dies, that's when that living will takes into effect. And you get the inheritance. Well, in that culture, it is actually an insult for the father, for a child, a son, to come to him and ask him about his inheritance while he's still alive. It's almost tantamount to saying, I wish you were dead already. Because that's the norm. You get your inheritance when, you're, when that father, when the parent dies. So, you know what? The father didn't mind. 
Look at the father, what he did. So he divided them his livelihood. So he divided the livelihood to between who? The younger and the older son. Two sons, okay? Now, let me explain to you how it's divided. You might be thinking, oh, now they got 50-50. The older son got 50 and the younger son got 50. No, it doesn't happen that way in their culture. The older, the firstborn, usually get the double portion of the inheritance. So there's two of them. So guess how many percent did the older son get? Double portion. That will be two-thirds. Two-thirds will be the older sons. The younger son gets one-third of the livelihood of the father. Okay? I want you to remember that. How much the older son got. So the older son got a lot more than the younger son, right? Yes. So let's look at what happens next. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So he wasted everything. One-third of his father's um, livelihood was all used up. Okay? But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now, Remember, Jesus was talking to Jews, right? The audience here, there's a multitude, there's tax collectors, there's sinners, there's Pharisees. So his audience are Jews. Now, for a Jew to be feeding swines, that would cause them to be unclean. Because swines are considered unclean animals and just to be associated with them, just to touch them, would cause them to be unclean. How much more taking care of these swine? Okay? So he's giving them a picture. He's giving the audience a picture, a real desperate situation. It is a Jew having to feed swine. And so it says here, and he would... Gla um, Verse 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him nothing. I thought at first the swine have shared him their food. But it says here, no one. Even the swine did not want to share. Poor son, right? No one shared with him. But when he came to himself, when he came to himself, how many of you know that we're, when we're at rock bottom, in our lives. That's when we come to ourselves. And what does that mean, coming to ourselves? You know what? I've, I've experienced where I was successful. I, was, I wasn't myself. And I don't know about you. You probably have been to a situation, been to a state in your life where you were so successful. Everything is going on right. Your job is, is doing great. You have Financially, you're successful. There's nothing going wrong. And how many of us have experienced that when there's nothing going on in our lives, when everything is doing great, we a lot of times forget about God. We, we don't think of having to go to church. You probably think, I don't have to go to church because there's a, I don't have a need for it. I, I was one of those persons when going to church was because there's a need. And we are like this, like this young son, that when we're at the very lowest point of our lives, that's when we come to ourselves. Come to ourselves in what way? And let's look here. So he said, he came to himself, and he said, how many of my father's hard servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. How many of my father's servants, he's saying, that my servants, they're serving my father, and yet they have bread, and not just enough bread, but what he's saying is they have bread and enough to spare. There is abundance. Also, what the son is thinking here is seeing is that in this famine, in this famine, 
where, where he's having to feed the swine, he remembers the prosperity of his father. And this is like in, in this parable, this father here is actually God. God, okay, with God, he is not affected by our world economy. God's blessing is not limited to how good your job is, how good it pays. God's blessing is not dependent on how well you do it in, at work. God's blessing is independent of those things. God's reserve, God's riches is independent of what the world can do and can give. This is likened to this father. Even in the, in the middle of the famine, he remembers in my father's house, there's my, uh, my father's servants are enjoying those bread, the bread, and they have enough more to spare. And I perish with hunger. And he said to himself, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Why? Why do you think he said that, a younger son? Make me like one of your hired servants. Remember what he thought of? In my father's house, our servants have bread to eat. Notice the motive of this son going back to the father. Was it because he loved his father? No. The reason why he was going back to his father is because of his stomach. He's hungry. He's dying in hunger. How many of us have seen people come to church because they're desperate? Not because they love God, but because they don't have a job and they need a job, so they go to church. How many of us have seen people who go to church because they have a need? And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes it is us who have been in church for a while that we start looking at those people. Oh, he's coming here just because he needs something. And let's, let's see what God, what Jesus has to say about that way of thinking. And so he says, I'm no longer. So remember this rehearsed speech that the young, had, young son have done, okay, have, have prepared. He said, I will arise and go to my father and I will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. He didn't even say, Father, I love you. I'm sorry. No. I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants, because I know in my father's house, even the servants have bread and enough more to spare. All right? And so he arose and came to his father. But when he was still afar off, a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Look at this. When he was still a great way off, it was a picture of the father who was always expecting for the son to come back. And this is a picture of God. When you turn away and when we think that we've ran away from God, sometimes we think, oh, God has forgotten us. You know why? Because sometimes as uh, you're the people in church, when somebody leaves, that's what we tend to think. Oh, let's just forget about those people when they leave. But you know what? The heart of God is He's always expectant for that person who left will come back one day. And when He sees, you see, He saw Him a way, a great way off. There's just this expectancy with God. When somebody leaves, he has this expectancy. And he says his, his father saw him and had compassion. Could you imagine how the son would look like? Dirty, having, having been uh, feeding the swine, okay? The smelly, stinky smell. It can be the scent of alcohol. It can be a scent of drug addiction, it can be the scent of uh, sexual addiction. It can be the scent of whatever sin that you could imagine. That is the picture of the son. But what is the attitude of the father to the son? The father was still excited. 
you know, sometimes what we think is, you know what, I go to church when I'm all settled. I'm, I'll go to church when I'm all straightened up. I'll go to church when I have my, uh, uh, all my act together. Have you heard of people say that? The word, I'm going to go to church when I'm ready. You know, have you gone take a shower and clean yourself before you take a shower? No, you take a shower so you can be cleaned, right? So you can be washed, right? It's just the same way coming to Christ. Going to God is not I have to cleanse myself so that I'll be, uh, I'll be accepted by God. No, no matter what cleansing you do on your own, it's not going to be enough. Because the Bible says even our righteous works are like filthy rags to Him. Even the best thing that we could uh, do the most righteous deed that we can do on our own compared to His holiness is just filthy rags to Him. So what should be our attitude when we come to Him? Okay? Amen. And when we come to Him, when you fall, a lot of times when we fall and do something wrong, we get so condemned, right? We feel, we feel so condemned and we think, oh, I'm not worth it to come to him. I'm not worth it to go to him. Uh, and you know what? The problem, where the problem lies, sometimes it's because of the church. It's because of the people who go to church. It's because those people who think that they're, they're okay. And they see these people who are in sin, who are still living in sin. That these people who are living in sin... They think twice before they go to church because they know there are people's eyes who's going to look at them differently. But what we need to know is God, even God does not see them that way. So why would we, why should we see those people? Instead, when we have a person, when we have a brother or a sister who is in sin, we'll continue to love them. Show them God's love. And it is God's love, it is God's goodness who would turn them around. The Bible says it is God's goodness who leads people to repentance. It is God's goodness. So he saw his son real dirty, real stinky, right? And he ran and fell on his neck. Now, he didn't fall because the father was old. Don't be thinking the father tripped and, and he fell on his neck. It is an idiom, okay? Not an idiot. It's an idiom, okay? Uh, that when they fell on their neck, it's like hugging the neck. In the Jewish culture, to fell on somebody's neck is to hug them. Just like when the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples on the day of Pentecost, they didn't fall like, no, the Holy Spirit hugged the disciples, embraced them. Meaning, we see when you're embraced by somebody, what happens to you? You disappear in that embrace, right? When the Father embraced the Son, when the Father embraced the Son, the Son's filthiness, the son's sins, the son's stinkiness disappeared because the father covered with his embrace. He kissed him. He kissed him. You know, for, for married couples, I know when you're, you know, when you have a quarrel, you're, you're fighting with each other. An LQ, lover's quarrel, right? You kiss after you reconcile, correct? All right? But notice how the character of God is. Even before the son said anything, the son didn't even have a chance to say sorry. The son didn't even have a chance to say the speech that he rehearsed, but the father kissed him already. The father received him already. And the son said to him, so now here's the rehearsed speech, okay? You remember the rehearsed speech? Father, I've sinned against heaven and, 
and against heaven and against you. I'm no longer to be called your son. Make me one of my heart's servants, right? So let's read. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, why is there a but? Why is there a but? You see, the father deliberately interrupted the son. Because if the son said, make me one of your hard servants, it is an attitude going back to the father, but to earn, to get the father's blessing, I'm going to have to work for it. But look at the attitude of God to somebody, towards somebody who they're thinking they could earn his blessing. He said, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. The robe signifies acceptance. He become righteous, the right standing, right standing. And did the son have to get the robe? It was brought to him. When Jesus came to save us, God has provided the robe of our righteousness. We didn't have to work for the righteousness. Only thing we need to do is to receive and keep that robe. He put on a ring on his hand. The ring signifies authority. Authority, what? Because his position as a son is being reinstated. And the sandals on his feet is a position as a son. Because the servants don't have sandals. When you're a servant, you don't have sandals. But when you have sandals on, you're in the family. Remember when Moses met Jesus? I met, met Jehovah. The burning bush. God instructed him, remove your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. Why? Some of you have probably thought, I wish I was Moses. With all the miracles that he's seen, God has done in his behalf. You know what? I will never exchange my position right now to any character in the Old Testament. All the characters in the Old Testament they were servants. That is why he can't put his sandals. He can't keep his sandals. They were all servants. But with you and I, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, he restored your sonship. He restored your position as a son. Your position as a son. Whether you're a female or male, you're a son. And there's a significance with being a son. Is this good? And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. See, the, there's people who say the, the, the thing that was really sorry in this, in this situation was not the son. It was the calf. Because the calf had to be killed. And let us eat and be merry. For he was lost and is found... And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. Now let me remind you again. Remember the reason why Jesus was sharing this parable? It was to answer the Pharisees' complaint. Why is this man receiving and eating with the sinners? Okay? Now his older son was in the field. And, he, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He heard music and dancing. And he said, uh, so he called one of the servants and asked, what these things, man, what's going on here? What is this about? Why is, this, why is there music and dancing? And look at what the father said, or what the servant said, because your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. That is why there is music and dancing. That is why we have music and dancing at church. Because we are rejoicing with the father for every soul, for every person that comes to him, that comes back to him. 
It can be a person that is fit for the first time to come to Him. Or it can be a person who's, who have been with us, have been long gone, and decided to come back. That's the reason why we rejoice. Sometimes we think that our rejoicing and our praise and worship is like sacrifice for God. Sacrifice to God. Well, if you have the attitude, that's not so. Our worship, our praises is not sacrifice because th there's nothing, there's nothing that we could give to God that would love, that would, uh, that where He would love us more or less. He have made a decision that He loved us, that He so loved us that He gave His Son. So our praise and worship is a sign that we are rejoicing with Him every Sunday. We are rejoicing with Him for His goodness, for His kindness, for His mercy, for His grace. That is the reason why we rejoice, why we praise, and why we worship. But he was angry, the older brother. He was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. You see, that servant is, was the picture of the Holy Spirit. You know that sometimes we are tugged by the Holy Spirit. When, we're, uh, when we're, we don't want to go to the Father, we're mad at Him. There's this voice that's telling us, you go, you go. But then it can be a, it can be that something happened to us and we're mad at God. But you know who comes out? Who comes out to get us? It's the Father Himself. Look at this. Therefore, His Father came out and pleaded with Him. Look, look at the picture of the Father here. It is even the Father who is pleading, pleading, asking the child, asking the older son, come in, come in. So He answered and said to His Father, look at this answer of the older son. Lo, by the way, the Father is not Chinese, okay? Lo means behold, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never, get, never gave me a billy goat that I might make merry with my friends. What is the attitude of the son? The older son was saying, I've been here all along, serving you, slaving for you, and you have not given me one billy goat. A young goat, right? Billy goat. That I might make merry. Is it with my father? No, with my friends. He didn't even think about his father, right? But as soon as this son of yours, what is the attitude? What attitude can you see in this older son? He is disowning the younger son. This son of yours, he didn't say, my brother. No, this son of yours. How many of you who have kids, when something... Uh, like uh, a, a wife tells the husband, oh, that, that son of yours, that means the son did something wrong, right? <laughs> they get this own. And this is the same picture. This son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. And it was, it was right. You see, when, when God enjoys and have fun because somebody comes, He says, it is right. It is just right. It is right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Remember the question, why is this man? eating and receiving the sinners parable of the lost sheep at the end of the parable it says the man comes home rejoicing and then it says the angels whole heavens rejoice with one sinner coming back the lost coin right everybody rejoice when one is found parable of the prodigal son the joy of the father when he finds that lost son again. To answer the question, 
the Pharisee, why are you receiving? Prodigal, the, the lost sheep, speaks of the person of Jesus, who is the good shepherd. And the lost coin speaks of the spirit, because it is the light, turning on the light to find a lost coin. And the parable of the prodigal son speaks of the father. Really, the prodigal here is not the son. Prodigal means extravagant. You know who's extravagant here? It's the father. Because he extravagantly showed his love and mercy to the son. Even when the son did something to insult him. It was the prodigal father. And you know what? Why is this man eating and receiving sinners? It is because the father, the son, the Holy Spirit take joy when we eat with sinners. When we receive sinners, it brings God joy. That is the answer to the complaint of the Pharisees. It brings God joy for every one of us. And you might be sitting here right now. You're all, you know, you have everything together. But there will be, there will come a time when you will fall because nobody's immune. One day we'll find ourselves, we've rebelled, thinking we, you seemingly rebelled God. But you know God's attitude towards us is always saying, come back home. Whenever you come back home, I'm always here waiting for you. I'm always here waiting for you. But let me point you to one character, one more character. That son, it says, and he said to him, son, you are always with me. That son there came from the Greek word. The, the, the word that was used there was technon. Technon meaning a child, a little child. But let me bring you back where he referred to the younger son. Bring, but the father said to his serv servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Okay. And then for this, my son was dead. That son there was not technon. It's weos. The Greek word weos which means son, a grown-up son. Now, why am I pointing this out? Why am I pointing this out? You know, there's a lot of Christians right now. We have a huge inheritance. Remember how we started with the inheritance? The younger son asking for the inheritance. And look at the, the mentality of the older brother. How much inheritance did he get? Wasn't it two-thirds? Wasn't it double portion? And look at the mentality of the older son. I have been slaving with you. I have been following your commands, and yet you have not given me anything. Why did he have to wait for the father to give him anything? When he owns the rest of the father's livelihood, the whole time he was there. It's the same way with us. We have a full inheritance and yet we are not enjoying it. Because we think that by serving God, we get that blessing. We think that by, uh, by doing good, we, by our performance, we gain it. We get it. No, you already have it. And you know what you have to do is just take it and use it and claim it. That's the only thing you need to do. And see, when, when the father said, Son, you have been with me all this time. He referred to the son as technon, a child. But to the younger son who's able to receive the blessing, who's able to receive what the father has to give to him, he called that son weos. Why? In Galatians it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave. For as long as you are a technon, a little child, you're no different than a slave. Even you are a master of all. But it's under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, 
born of a woman, born under the law. To redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoptions as sons. For us who have received Christ, when Christ came here on earth, how he represented his father was as a father. As a father. Not as a judge. Not as anything else. Yes, Jehovah, I mean, uh, God is El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha. He's all that. But when Jesus came here on earth to represent his father, he was representing the father as Abba Father. Daddy God. If you have a sense at this point in your life, you see God as somebody who's distant. You see God as somebody who's going to go after you when you do something wrong. You see God as somebody that, who's not going to bless you until you're right. You're probably seeing God not as Abba Father, but as the other, the other titles of God. But you see, God's heart is for that every believer every believer who comes to him to see him as Abba Father. Why? Why Abba Father? Because we can always run to him. We can always run to him when we need to. We can just call him Daddy. You know, when my children call me Daddy and it's a yell, I go right away. I don't ask what. You know, your parents, you know the tone of a child who is in trouble and then when they call out daddy, when they call out mommy, you don't have to be asking, why are you calling me? No, you go out rushing to your child to find out what's going on. And that's how God wants to be seen. When you pray, sometimes we pray, oh, heavenly father, could you give it me thy food today? We're so, we're so formal. But God wants it where, Daddy, I'm weak and I don't know what to do. Could you help me? You know, the Bible says even the groaning God hears. You don't have to say anything. God hears. If you're still seeing God as somebody who's distant, as somebody who's formal, as somebody who's old, you know, God is not old. Being old is part of the curse. God is, is young and, and, and vibrant and, and powerful and strong who's able to come to your aid the moment you call Him. Who's able and willing He's always willing. And this is the reason why a lot of Christians, they live life defeated. They live life missing out on the inheritance. Why? Because we might have, we, we probably have the spirit of the older son. But what God wants us to, say, to have is the spirit of sonship. Not of a child, of son. Because when you are a son, you are an heir. You are an heir. What is an heir? An heir is somebody who takes a hold of the inheritance and is able to enjoy that inheritance. Because for as long as you are a child, and, and this is another, another, another topic, another message in itself. Being a child, and I thought at first it's, oh, when I'm, I'm, I'm a newly a new believer, I'm a child. No, I thought it was the, uh, how long have you been a Christian? No, it's not that. But suffice to say, God is wanting us to have the spirit of sonship. A son, even when you do something wrong, that you can always go to God. And you just receive His forgiveness. You receive His forgiveness. Amen. And as you know that you're righteous before God all the time, then you'll have the boldness to enjoy the inheritance. And what is this inheritance? Peace in your mind, health in your body, 
prosperity in your life, wholeness in your relationship, that is your inheritance. Amen. Let's bow our heads. See, it's very important that we know that we are sons of God. And not just knowing that we're sons, but we have to live and act like we are sons of God. I ask the Holy Spirit right now to reveal to every one of you, every one of us, in what area of my life that I'm acting like a child, not able to inherit my inheritance. And Holy Spirit, I ask you just to reveal that area. And God, as we have the Holy Spirit in us, you witness to them that they are sons. And if there's somebody here who, who you don't know whether you're a son of God or not, you have not asked God, you have not asked Christ Ask Jesus to enter into your life. You don't remember a day where you ask Him to come into your life and, and receive His forgiveness. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Now, if you have prayed this prayer and then you meant it in your heart in the past, you know, you are saved already. You are a child of God. Yes, even when you don't feel like it. You are a child of God already. But I'm talking to those who they've never, you know, you never ask God. You never ask Christ to come into your life. I want you to repeat this prayer with me. God, I thank you for what you have given me. God, I thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. I thank you that you have forgiven me when Jesus died on the cross. And God, there is nothing that I can do to earn a right standing before you. And so, Lord, I accept what Jesus has done. I accept your gift of righteousness through Christ. I receive you, Jesus. I believe that you died for my sins, that you were buried, and on the third day you rose again from the dead. I believe that in my heart, and I accept the sacrifice you have done on my behalf. And God, thank you for your forgiveness, and I receive it. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Now, if you're that person who prayed that prayer, it was your first time. You are a child of God today. Remember this day. You are a child of God. That even you've done, you do something wrong later on, you stay a child of God. Because the Bible says, when God keeps you in His hand, nobody can pluck you away from His hand. He gives you eternal life, and eternal life, from the last time I checked, is eternal. It's eternal. Eternal is forever. It's not eternal life until your next sin. It is just like the son did something wrong against his father, but when he came back, he was still a son. The son who stayed with him, served him, enslaved for the father, but never really considered himself a real son. Who would you want to be? I would want to be a Yuyos, a son, a full-grown son. If you're that person who, who prayed that prayer the first time, could I see your hand? Could I see your hand, please? If 
it's your first time, thank you very much. Thank you. From now on, you're, you're a child of God. And in the future, somebody asks you to pray. You don't have to pray even if they, you feel like, you know, I did something wrong. Do I have to pray? No, you don't have to. Just like that younger son, even when he fell, he comes back still a son. All you have to do is go back, come to him, and you have the Father receiving you. Amen. Have you been encouraged? You know, I pray... I do encourage every one of you. If you've seen the Word of God, the Bible, as something that, and you know, you have to read because now I'm a Christian. And this is one thing that Christians do. No, think of, think of it as the Word of God is your bread. It is the bread of life. It is the bread of life. It's supposed to fill you up. It's supposed to satisfy you. It's supposed to strengthen you. That's what the Bible does. If you see the Bible as something that you have to do, that when you don't read it, you become guilty of not reading, then you're not eating it. You're just reading it. I encourage you, next time you read your Bible, you ask the Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus in me. Why? Why Jesus? Because Jesus is the bread of life. It is when you see Jesus in the verses that you read, that's when you get encouraged and that when you get nourished. Amen. Let's all stand up to our feet. Father God, we bless you this afternoon. We thank you for your word, God. Lord, I speak a blessing over everyone here. Your blessing and favor be over everyone. Your blessing and favor would follow us all the days of our lives. And not just that, Lord God, all the days of this week, Lord, everywhere we go, everywhere your children go, be in school, at work, in the marketplace, in the neighborhood, at home, your favor and blessing and mercy be over everyone here. Not because of what they've done, not because they deserve it, but because of your grace, mercy, and because of your love over us. Would you pour out your love over them? In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, church, and we'll see you next Sunday.